Iran is attacking the United States with drugs? What's the most dangerous thing you can do on vacation? And we'll break down the president's speech on the border, today on The Hot Zone. This is The Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, I'm Chuck Holton. If you can't defeat your enemy militarily, poisoning from the inside is one way you can destroy them without an outright war. Well, according to a new report, that's exactly what Iran was doing during the Obama administration, sending poison across our southern border and making lots of money doing it. In fact, the Iranian-backed Hezbollah terror organization was making billions Billions through its criminal enterprises, including massive drug trafficking into the United States across our southern border. There was a DEA project called Project Cassandra, which was an operation launched by the Drug Enforcement Administration in 2008, and it uncovered a billion dollars a year from money laundering and criminal activities and drug and weapons trade being collected by Hezbollah, and this is according to an article in The Politico. The undercover project went on for eight years, and in that time, the DEA found that Hezbollah was involved in cocaine shipments from Latin America to West Africa, as well as through Venezuela and Mexico to the United States. And then the Obama administration turned it off. They halted the project, Cassandra, just as it was about to blow the Iranian operation wide open. The reason was the White House was about to seal that terrible nuclear deal with Iran, even though Hezbollah was still funneling cocaine into America at that time. The Obama administration appointed officials at the U.S. Justice and Treasury Departments that delayed the Cassandra Project's requests and prosecutions and arrests as well. In 2015, plane loads of cash were being sent to Iran to close that deal, and the Cassandra Project was shut down. Now, my only question is this. How is this not treason? I mean, intentionally blocking a productive criminal investigation in order to shield an enemy state from any damaging information, all while that, that state is actively shipping deadly narcotics into our country? Well, to me, that's kind of mind-numbing. I mean, since 2001, Iran and Hezbollah have been full court press to gain influence in the more Chavista-leaning countries of Latin America. I'm talking, you know, Venezuela, Cuba, Bolivia, Nicaragua, among others. Venezuela especially, where government officials worked closely with Hezbollah to damage the U.S. any way they could, especially by flooding the U.S. with cocaine and helping to smuggle upwards of 250 tons of that narcotic to the U.S. every year. Now, back in August of 2017, Donald Trump made a somewhat offhanded comment about the possibility of using military force in Venezuela. We have many options for Venezuela, including a possible military option if necessary. Now, I'm sure you're not surprised to find he was ridiculed for saying that, which is, you know, obvious. It happens all the time with everything he says. Now, look, in all fairness, the president's declaration was kind of strange at the time. But if we ever needed a reason to invade Venezuela, it was provided by the DEA and Operation Cassandra. In February, the Trump administration sanctioned several Venezuelan officials, including the acting vice president, Tarek El Asimi, for their alleged ties to Hezbollah. They're, they charged El Asimi with overseeing shipments of tons of cocaine from Venezuela to the United States. Now, if you recall, the U.S. invasion here in Panama back in 1989 to depose the Panamanian President Manuel Noriega, then President George H.W. Bush's reasoning for that invasion was almost exactly what we're seeing in Venezuela right now. Noriega was hip deep in money laundering and helping out the drug cartels and ended up spending most of the rest of his life in a U.S. federal penitentiary because of it. So there is a precedent. Now, ever since Trump made those comments about invading Venezuela, many here in Latin America have been kind of obsessed with the idea that it's really going to happen, which is, uh, it's not going to happen. I mean, it's extremely unlikely. But just the other day, I got a voicemail from a guy here in Panama out near the Darien jungle who saw some military helicopters flying around, and he was absolutely sure it was the U.S. military massing for an invasion. In reality, it was probably a Southcom joint exercise with the Panamanian border police, but People down here really think it could happen anytime. 
Nevertheless, Hezbollah's activities in Latin America potentially pose a threat to U.S. national security, and they need to be met forcefully however we can. Now, one way we could stem the tide of drugs coming into our country would be to build a substantial barrier on our southern border, you know, like maybe a wall or something. On Tuesday night, President Trump made quite possibly one of the most wooden speeches I've ever seen from a U.S. president. Seriously, that guy is just not a very good speaker. But the content of his speech was very important. Our southern border is a pipeline for vast quantities of illegal drugs, including meth, heroin, cocaine, and fentanyl. Every week, 300 of our citizens are killed by heroin alone, 90 percent of which floods across from our southern border. More Americans will die from drugs this year than were killed in the entire Vietnam War. Now, this is a very important point. The drugs coming across our southern border could be substantially reduced by a more imposing physical barrier. I mean, according to the Drug Enforcement Administration, the vast majority of drugs that kill American citizens every year enter our country through the U.S. southern border. They classify the Mexican cartels as being in a class all by themselves, based on the thousands of tons that they manage to get in here every year. Now, the old fence along the border just really doesn't do much at all to stop them. They call it the tortilla curtain for a reason. H.L. Cooper has been flying ultralight aircraft around southern Arizona for more than 20 years. This incredible view shows the vastness of the desert along the Arizona-Mexico border. But along with the beautiful vistas of mountains and saguaro cactus, Cooper sees another sight on a regular basis from his vantage point in the sky. Illegal aliens transporting drugs across the desert bound for America's fifth largest city, Phoenix. Nowadays, there's a whole lot more drug running than, uh, than there used to be. Uh, this is one of the highest traffic areas, this valley here, and the next valley over there, that's the Ultra Valley over there. And uh, it's a heavily traveled route there. Illegal immigration has always been an issue. What's changed is the level of violence. It's been getting worse and worse, but as far as safer, no. We're right in the middle of it. When they come out of this valley, we're one of the first places they come to. We've been vandalized, we've been stolen from. We used to hike all over the desert out here anymore. Now we don't go out without being armed. And the problem isn't only on the ground. The Border Patrol reports that drug runners are using ultralight aircraft like this to bring loads of drugs across the border and drop them in the United States. But they're not the only thing in the sky. Recently, the Border Patrol started using remotely piloted surveillance aircraft to patrol the desolate stretches of desert where smuggling is prevalent. These eyes in the sky also help the effectiveness of agents on the ground. But residents along the border say more needs to be done. Rancher Ed Asher's neighbor was murdered by a drug runner earlier this year. When I first moved to this country, most of the activity you saw was people going north looking for a job. The last several years it's changed into mainly outlaw activity. They pack dope north, drop it off, and on the way south they like to break into homes here on the American side and pack off things. They really like to steal firearms. And 80% of the homes have been burglarized in the last two winners by illegal aliens. Seeing it, we have more illegals that come through our county than any other county. Further north, Pinal County Sheriff Paul Babu says his hands are full protecting residents here from the drug violence, and he hasn't gotten much help from the federal government. In fact, the Obama administration recently supported the ACLU in bringing a lawsuit against Babu and several other Arizona sheriffs suing to stop them from enforcing Arizona's immigration law. This is a hotbed for criminal activity. We need soldiers, armed soldiers, to the border now to stop this from continuing. In response to our plea for help and for armed soldiers, they put up these signs not written in Spanish, not facing south to the Mexican border, but facing north in English. Warning to our citizens, uh, travel not recommended. This is unacceptable. While the war of words continues in Washington, the people of southern Arizona face weapons that are much deadlier. This year alone, the drug war along the border has claimed more than 2,500 lives. That's nearly five times the number of American troops killed this year in Afghanistan. 
I believe that this is a greater threat against our national security than any other threat that exists today, an unsecured border. Pinal County law enforcement regularly encounters armed drug smugglers who have all but taken over wide areas of this high mountain desert. From this point on, it's a standing order that we don't come more than two deputies coming out here due to one of our deputies getting shot in the leg. In addition to the danger, trash left by illegals is becoming a major environmental hazard. Okay, so this is kind of what we're seeing here. The illegals come down out of the mountains, come across the desert for three to five days walking, then they dump all their stuff here next to the freeway, get on trucks, and head into Phoenix. But this is something interesting. Notice this bag. It has an American flag on it, and it says United States Aid from the Agency for International Development, USAID, aid from the American people. This is a bag that we sent down to Central America filled with bulgur wheat and now it's coming back filled with drugs. Now, if you're listening to the podcast and couldn't see the video we just played, there are several shots in that package that show men hiking across the desert with bulky square backpacks on their backs. Those backpacks are filled with marijuana and cocaine and heroin and who knows what else. Each one of those can weigh up to 100 pounds. And that's something that's happening along the frontier literally hundreds of times every single day. The Border Patrol seizes about 6,000 pounds of narcotics every day coming into the United States. And that's really just a drop in the bucket of what's actually coming across. So those who say a more substantial barrier wouldn't help, listen, I've been reporting on this issue for 15 years, and I can tell you the number one thing we could do to reduce the amount of drugs coming across the border would be to build a fence that can't be cut down or easily climbed over. Are there tunnels? Sure. The cartels use hang gliders and drones and even catapults to toss dope over the fence. But the vast majority of it is simply driven across in pickup trucks or carried on the backs of those drug mules like we showed back there, who jump the fence where it's easiest and hike into the United States. As that rancher said in the piece, very often those same guys then rob people on their way back south just to make a little extra profit. So a wall would save lives and money, and that fact is indisputable. What's amazing to me is how it seems like President Trump has this magical ability to make Democrats come out against literally anything. All he has to do is voice support for it. Suffice it to say there's a huge battle taking place right now in the media to convince average Americans that a wall would be a waste of money. And I can assure you it would not. And a wall would stand the test of time. No future administration would be able to tear it down. Policies can change. A 30-foot concrete barrier won't. Finally today, a tragic story out of Zimbabwe that painfully illustrates the risks of traveling on public transportation in the third world. 47 people, 45 adults and two children, were killed when two buses collided on the highway east of Zimbabwe's capital of, of Harare. The horrific images of the crash were heavily censored in the local media because they were just too graphic. Now, I've known for a long time that driving on the roads in developing countries is one of the most dangerous aspects of my life as an international traveler. I tell people all the time the most dangerous thing I'm required to do in this job is drive to the airport here in Panama, where if you want to stay alive on the road, you pretty much have to drive like you're trying to get arrested. But I went and looked up some statistics about road fatalities, and even I was shocked at just how treacherous ground transport can be in developing countries. In the United States, for example, we have less than one fatality for every 100 million kilometers driven. Now contrast that with some countries in Africa, and you might not want to know, in Egypt it's 43 times higher. In Kenya, it's 36 per 100 million kilometers driven. Now over 36,000 people die each and every year on the roads in the United States. But in India, that number is like a quarter million. I mean, yikes. Based on the population, that's about 60% higher than the United States. Now, someday, self-driving cars are going to take over the world, and if you ask me, it can't come soon enough. One, because I don't like driving, and two, because I believe artificial intelligence would be much, much smarter than all the idiots who are on the road today who seem to follow me around, okay? <laughs> now, be careful out there, folks. Check us out on YouTube if you haven't seen the video version of the podcast, because you'd get a lot more out of it that way. I'm not going to be able to put out a video version every day while I'm on the road, especially when I'm in Syria, for example. 
but the plan is to do at least to try to release an audio version whenever possible. Now, please like and share the podcast with your friends. The great feedback I'm getting from you guys really means a lot, and I, I really appreciate it. All right, that's all for today. We'll be back again tomorrow right here on The Hot Zone. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media, copyright 2019.